It is, sadly, the last talk of the Docs Down Under Mini Conference. Um, but fortunately, Nicola is here to talk to us about caterpillars. And I understand lettuce and cheese, maybe some gherkin, a little bit of Reuben, I don't know. So it sounds tasty. Um, and most importantly, she's going to tell us about FOSS and documentation. So take it away. Good afternoon. Right. Welcome to my talk, Helping Caterpillars Fly. Obligatory introduction. I'm Nicola and I work, uh, ooh, I work with words. I also like helping people and mostly I like helping people with words. So that makes me a technical writer, but I didn't start off that way. Uh, my first job out of university was actually doing technical support for Hot Dog, one of the world's first WYSIWYG HTML editors. And let me tell you, attempting to do technical support on a product like that introduced me at the very cold face to people who had no idea what they were doing and they were seeking technical support help. That gave me a very good introduction on why it is vital that you have really good user documentation so that your users don't have to actually talk to you directly. I've then suddenly gone on to work in uh, the fields of Java programming across the years and uh, project management for many of Melbourne's iconic internet startups. Uh, many of which are no longer with us. Um, so I've had the experience from a programming perspective on what it's like to have good and bad user documentation. Uh, and now I do that professionally for a living at Fastmail. We have a, a, a webmail platform. Um, but part of my time while it is spent on Fastmail documentation, I'm also gloriously paid to work on Cyrus. Cyrus is an open source email providing platform. Uh, it's uh, two years younger than Linux, 24 years old. So I was brought in to pull together the mess of documentation, 24 years worth from 24 years worth of collaborators and turn it into something that made sense, turn it into something that was up to date, turn it into something that we could be proud of. That's enough about me. What about you? Who here likes words? Please tell me all your hands are going up, otherwise what are you doing in this room? <laughs> Who here uses free open source software? Again, you're a Linux conf, please, I need all the hands. <coughs> Who here actually reads documentation? Oh, okay, that was good. Who here writes documentation? Oh, most of you even look like you might do it willingly. <laughs> Who has seen an open source project fail? And by fail, I don't necessarily mean that it falls over and explodes in your face, I just mean something that maybe hasn't been maintained for a number of years. Uh, something that maybe has died and forked and died and forked and still can't quite get it to life. Who here likes bugs? There's software bugs, sure, but this is the docs track, I'm not talking about that. There's Louis the Fly, but we're not talking about those kind of bugs either. I'm talking about caterpillar bugs! <laughs> what? Alright, so what I want to talk to you about is how the life cycle of a caterpillar is similar to the life cycle of an open source project. I want to tell you why cocoons are hard, why it is that it's hard for, for caterpillars to bust out of cocoons and why open source projects have the same problem and the cocoons are uh, where the projects tend to fail, why they don't turn into butterflies. I'm going to tell you that code is not the answer. The documentation is the answer to making your project succeed. And I'll follow up with some practical tips and ideas that I've learnt from working on Cyrus in the last couple of years and some ideas that I have going forward. All right, I'm a mother. This means that I get to read stories to my children in silly voices quite regularly. <laughs> Let's do it again professionally. Okay, so once upon a time, a little egg lay on a leaf. One sunny morning, the sun came up and out of the egg hatched a very small and very tiny caterpillar. So the egg is your idea. The egg comes around in an open source project when someone says, wouldn't it be good if we could... Turns into a caterpillar when you actually start making things happen. You've written some code, it's getting out there, you're getting some traction, it's up on GitHub, maybe you've got a mailing list happening. Other people are starting to contribute and get involved. Tiny caterpillar, quite hungry. Caterpillar, over the course in the original story, eats through bits and more bits and fruit during the, during the course of the week. In your open source project, that is it coming along, adding feature 
onto a feature, onto a feature. And then in the original story, it comes up to Saturday and it eats all of the junk food it can possibly think of. Mmm, cake. <laughs> in the open source project world, this is it going mad. It is bloated, it is crazy, it's on fire. You can't think that this thing could possibly fail. You are now going to enter the stage of the cocoon. This is where your project is either going to grow wings and fly, or it's going to fall in a heap under its own weight. It has become unmaintainable. Hopefully you turn into a butterfly. Everybody loves butterflies much more than caterpillars. So if the cocoon is the problem, if getting from a caterpillar into a butterfly is the problem, how do we solve this? How do we get out of that cocoon? How do we get our project to grow wings? Well, the cocoon's really got one of two states. Hopefully, you turn into a butterfly. It's the cocoon of criticality. More often than not, if you have a look at things like SourceForge and GitHub, you can see that there are huge amounts of open source projects that fail. They have been born, they have been used once, and they've never been touched again. Maybe they fork. They fork and die, they fork and die, they fork and die. And maybe a few go on to fork and live. All right, so what causes projects to fail? Let's have a look at some of them. This is by no means a complete list. So the first thing is going to be no or poor documentation. However, listening to the earlier talk on the state of kernel documentation, this is clearly not the only thing that's going <laughs> to cause your project to fail. That's, that's uh, obviously gone on and succeeded despite it. But people can't come along. They find it hard to know what it is that your project does. They find it hard to know to, to whether they would, would use it or even how to use it without documentation. So that's a no-brainer. Contributor turnover is going to kill your project. If all the people with the knowledge in your project leave before you can get that knowledge shared and into the new brains of the people who are coming on board, your project will <coughs> die. Creeping feature bloat. In the original story, the caterpillar eats all of the pickles, all of the cheeses, all of the hamburgers and the sausages and the cake until he can't move anymore and he has to make a cocoon. But if your project takes on all of the possible features that every single user has ever thought of, it's going to die as well, particularly if the people who came up with those great ideas and features run off into the sunset laughing merrily, leaving you to maintain code you didn't write and don't even want. Poor quality will kill, you, kill your project, poor usability will kill your project, and obviously no users will kill your project. It can be the best, most amazing, you know, it can solve world hunger, but if nobody knows about it, your project's going to fail. <coughs> so I posit to you, there's one thing that's going to fix all of these. What do you think it might be? Documentation? You don't say. All right. So how does documentation fix those things? Well, the answer to no documentation is let's write documentation. And I'll talk to you a little bit more uh, later about some ideas on how you can make sure that that documentation is good quality. To solve the problem of contributor turnover, we want knowledge sharing. If you can get it out of someone's head and onto a piece of paper, a virtual piece of paper, you're going to um, make sure that even if someone leaves or is hit by a bus deliberately or accidentally, um, that you know, new people coming on board don't have to start from scratch. <coughs> to solve the problem of creeping feature bloat, if you have documented your project's core goals, it makes it much easier to push back when someone comes along with some neat feature that only 5% of your users actually need. To deal with the problem of poor quality of your software, if you can document your standards, which hopefully include testing, uh, you're better able to make sure that, that uh, the quality is going to be maintained. For, for dealing with poor usability, documentation helps again. If you cannot describe it in documentation terms, and hopefully you as a documenting professional have got access to the core developers, how, if you can't just document it, how on earth are you, the poor users going to understand what's going on? So you can shorten that feedback loop, go straight back to the developers and say, I really can't describe this in words of one syllable to our user base. We need to work together on fixing this. Uh, and if you've got no users, a good way to fix that is with documentation. If you can write some marketing documentation explaining not, not just what your project is, but why someone wants to use it, you've made a huge first step towards fixing your no user problem. All right, so we've looked at the cocoon. We've looked at the caterpillar and the butterfly. We've looked at why projects fail and how documentation can help. 
So now I'm going to go into the practical tips. So these are lessons that I have learned from working on Cyrus Project. Um, I'm not going to go through the obvious stuff. People in this room by now hopefully know how software projects work and fail and how documentation works. So uh, th these are some sort of extra tips that I think might be useful. So let's look at some people tips. This is my first suggestion. For a free open source <laughs> software project, you need to pay a technical writer. I'm actually serious. If you've got a paid technical writer available to work on your project, it solves all the problems. It also means that you are more likely to have uh, new contributors come and join your open source project. It means that your core goals are going to be focused. It means that all of those things that I mentioned before that will kill your project are going to be addressed. So how do you go about getting a paid technical writer onto a free open source project? Now, this is, this, how you go about this might vary depending on whether you are that technical writer and you want to get paid to work on an open source project that you care deeply about, or perhaps you are someone that uses an open source project and you think it's awesome, but you'd like it to be better, and please, God, don't make me be the one who has to write the documentation. So you contact the stakeholders, someone who uses heavily and openly a particular project. There might be more than one of them. You put forward a business case with cost-benefit analysis covering the kinds of things that I've just mentioned in the talk earlier to say, if you pay someone to work on this project that your company so heavily depends upon, you will help guarantee that this software does not vanish in a puff of smoke. You will help guarantee that you get new contributors onto this project, which means that for free, you get the benefit of a global people who are coming along to improve this product that you depend upon. Not only that, if you pay me, then I can also act in some respects as a product advocate. So if you've got bugs that you really need to be fixed or a feature that you'd really like to see included, if you've got a paid advocate on staff who is working on the documentation, they're likely also, by dint of, of what we do, we have an oversight across the entire project as documenters, you're more likely to see that, that feature or that fix come to completion particularly when you consider that the company is already paying for their open source software through their time of the engineers, the time they spend finding bugs, fixing bugs, swearing under their breath, mailing lists, up on Stack Exchange, Googling, why does this thing not work? How do I configure it? I want to integrate it with this other thingamajigger. If you've got a paid documentation person who is going out there and making this easy for, for them and other people, your engineers are less likely to be spending their time doing this sort of stuff. Right, that's people tip number one. Audiences. This has come up again and again and again in the talks that I've heard today. So you've got the obvious audiences, and open source software usually talks about the existing user. So I'm not going to talk about them. You already know how to identify your existing order. I want to talk about people that we often forget about when writing for open source projects. Marketing documentation hardly ever comes up, but you need to sell your product. New users. Getting together an install and configuration guide that is simple and is covered in about two pages is what you need to, to convince your users that they want to come on board and use your project. If they can't get it up and working really quickly, they're going to go somewhere else. Don't forget your administrators. The people who are, who are installing and configuring this software are often not the people who are necessarily using it. Contributors, if you want to make it easy for people to come on board and write code, or even better, write tests and documentation, make sure that you've got contributor guides that cover each of these use cases and make it easy and accessible so they want to feel included. And then you've got the little known you, uh, audience of, help me, I saw this error message this one time from your project and what does it mean? So you want to make sure that you're externally visible error messages or, or situations are easily searchable and preferably linked back to your marketing docs so that you can encourage more users to come on board. Now, tech writing is all about communication. It's all about passing on the knowledge to other people. And we, we often think about, as, as tech writers, we often think about talking to the users, talking externally. But also, if you're to do your job effectively, you need to talk within the team. So this is communication. Don't forget you have global contributors and global users. So watch your colloquialisms. You're building a community because you can't communicate if there's no community. So look out for your inclusive language. 
Make sure you've got a code of conduct so people feel safe to come in and join in. It is no use excluding women contributors by the kind of language that you use. That's missing out on half of the global population of people who can come and help you. And think about what the mechanisms are that you're going to be. How would you, as a technical writer, like to talk to your developers? How do you want to get your developers to talk to one another? There's broadcast information, so mailing lists are great for that. But for nutting out the details of what did you mean when you said this, particularly open source where people are not co-located in an office, you can't say, um, I'll you know, go and hit you up in meeting room two tomorrow at 10. Slack and IRC are good, but they struggle a little bit with time zones. Cyrus, because we've got a smallish development team, we happen to have a hangout once a week. And some of us get up late and some of us get up early. <laughs> But it means that we can solve things on the spot and uh, have that dialogue without having to wait for people to go to sleep and wake up and go to sleep and wake up and that puts everything 12 hours behind. All right, so that's people, let's look at processes. You can't write all the documentation yourself. Your brain will explode and burst on fire. But you've got other people that can work for you. So you've got the developers. But developers often turn around and they, they say, I'm not a technical writer, I can't write documentation. I don't know how. How about I just send you the information and you do it? No. That way lies madness. Uh, you you want to empower them to do it for themselves. So you write a how-to. Developers, here's how to write documentation. No, that sounds a bit too crazy. Here's how to contribute documentation. And make it simple, make it easy, make it part of their existing tool chain. Integrate your bugs into their bug tracker so that they view documentation as code. We've heard that again today. Um, but the key thing, I think, also is to provide them positive feedback so that that gets cut short, that idea that they can't write documentation. The other idea is, is getting your users to write documentation for you. But the users are even less likely to go to the effort of sending out an email or, God forbid, rating, rating a uh, GitHub issue. So I'd say maybe you can talk about putting in a call to action into your existing documentation. It doesn't have to be the Microsoft way. Did this page make sense to you? Yes, no, I have feedback. It might just be sort of on a topic by topic basis. But if it's right there in front of them when they're trying to solve a problem, they're more likely to give you some feedback. And if you've got some really good users out there giving you really good strong feedback, something like sending them a happiness packet, uh, is a great way to encourage them to continue contributing. This sends them a, uh, a message, potentially anonymously, if you're not game to put your name on it, to say thank you very much for your kind words or your harsh words or whatever words they were, please come back and do it again. Regular reviews. Out of date documentation is worse than none. In an open source project like Cyrus that's 24 years old, we have a lot of out of date documentation. So I propose that maybe what we need is a last reviewed date that is publicly viewable. So if a user comes along and they see, their, see this documentation that says this was last reviewed one year ago or five years ago or ten years ago, they know how much trust that they can have in this documentation. They know if they need to maybe go and hit up the mailing list or the IRC channel for, you know, hey, sanity check, I've just read this but it said it was ten years old, is this still true? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But it's also good internally because then you have an idea of, all right, well, you know, let's set a hot date for ourselves. Let's go back and review this documentation. Which chunk do we need to look at next? Oh, this last stuff we looked at three months ago. Let's look, you know, maybe because there was a change request that went through. Let's have a look at this piece over here that hasn't actually been touched in a couple of years. That's where we should concentrate in our um, reviewing efforts. And then you need to consider for your project, who's the best person to review it? Do you get a subject matter expert? There are pros and cons. Subject matter experts tend to gloss over things because they've got an awful lot of existing knowledge that a new user might miss. On the other hand, there is some content that is so complicated, you have to have a subject matter expert to review. Fresh eyes. Hi, you're new to the project. Please check out our install guide. Does it still make sense? Is it still current? Do you, and do you get your users? If, if you've got that call to action in the documentation that says, did this solve your problem? And they say yes. Do you, that, do you view that as enough to say, right, this document actually has been reviewed relatively recently. Someone's looked at it and said, yes, it solved my problem. Bugs poo. Caterpillars poo. Projects poo. 
they leave their old documentation around everywhere. And it's not, I'm not, like the last slide was all about reviewing your internal documentation. This is all about looking at the external stuff. Out there in the world, there are so many pieces of documentation out there talking about how to integrate Cyrus with different kinds of mail transport agents. There's how to do it on, install it on 4,000 different platforms. And that's just Cyrus. I bet you guys have got projects out there too that have got um, information that other people have written that is out of date. A quick Google will bring you up a, a great bunch of links of software documentation. It's worth scheduling some time to go out there and contact those authors and say, please bring it up to date, take it offline, or put in a redirect towards us so that people are getting the most common. Because Google doesn't know what's old and new, and neither do your users. And if they find something that's out of date and they give it a go, they lose confidence in your project, even though it's nothing to do with you. Right, that's, so that's people and process tools. User profile affects your output format and location. This is just a fancy way of saying, have a look at your users and have a look at your contributors and figure out what is going to be the most accessible for the people who are using and contributing to your project. It could be wiki. It could be markdown or some sort of structured text. Maybe you're just chucking it onto GitHub in pages. Maybe you've got Madcap Flare, Microsoft Word, Adobe Project. I, you need to decide, depending on the kind of project that you've got, what's going to be the most appropriate for your users. But you do need to consider searchability and categorization, which I'm just going to defer to Darren. And if you missed his earlier talk about information architecture, that's kind of what I mean by categorization. If you haven't thought about how the modules of your information fit together in a logical, coherent way, it's going to be really difficult for your users to access your content. Template. Sure, everybody talks about templates. What are your document types? And I include this, I include sort of style guide fitting into the, uh, the idea of templates. But templates make it easy for people to come and contribute because they've got a form to fill out in, in essence. So you can use templates for um, bug reports. And it prompts them to enter in information that is relevant that maybe they haven't thought about. Hi, I click on this button in this field and it doesn't work. All right, so what browser are you on? What version of what browser? What operating system with what version of what browser are you using? And it gives you a consistent style for the content that's being contributed, even though you've got contributors from around the world. So it makes it less obvious that you know it's actually a patchwork beast. But not all good documentation is good documentation. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. So if you've got lots of FAQs, but without the content to back it up. Chances are this has been written by a bunch of expert developers who've got an awful lot of existing knowledge and the poor new user comes along and is not going to find their answer. So you, that is a good prompt to say, all right, let's look at this content in the FAQs. Some of it can easily be turned into task-based documentation backed up by the FAQs and some of it will reveal massive holes in your documents. If you've got no introduction for new people, and by new people, I mean users, I mean administrators, I mean contributors, even marketing like your new, new users. If you've got no introduction, they're not going to come on board. If your documentation is not with your code, well, we've heard that before, uh, it's, it's a sure sign that you're going to run into problems later on because people are going to say, so the syntax of, of, of this command appears to have changed from you know, version 2.4 to 3.0. If you can't be able to pull, up, pull apart your documentation and go, this doc's applied to this version, this doc's applied to this version, everybody gets very confused when they're trying to type things in on the command line and everything's on fire and people are yelling at you. And lack of clear categorization. Here we go again. OK. So we've got, we've got butterflies. We like butterflies. The butterflies are much better than caterpillars. We want our open source projects to succeed and have long, long, long lived lives like Cyrus and, and Linux. Documentation is the thing that makes butterflies. People are very happy to contribute code uh, in their spare time. People are not so happy to contribute documentation in their spare time. Documentation is nowhere near as fancy and as interesting. So you want to encourage people to, to do the right thing. I've talked an awful lot today, but if you can only remember three things, I would say, the most important is to get, uh, get a hold of a paid documentation advocate. You want to make it easy for all of your different kinds of users, including contributors. And you need to have regular reviews. Otherwise, all the stuff that's left behind will get in the way. 
But this can't be the whole list and I look forward to hearing from people if they've got any other ideas because I certainly haven't implemented most of this yet but I'm looking forward to. Has anybody got any questions? <laughs> And, and just in case you can't see, uh, Nicola has uh, butterflies in her hair and butterfly wings on her back. This is definitely the best dress speaker I've seen so far. It's, 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 this is incredible. All right, well, thank you. Aside from making me hungry, that was actually um, really quite thought-provoking as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw at least uh, one question up already, so. Hi, thank you for the talk. Hey. Um, Quick question, Do you, are you familiar with any methods or tools to allow you to track what kind of changes do you need to make in your documentation between different versions of the product? Let's say it's like some library, some... some I, um, we use um, Sphinx uh, with restructured text in Cyrus and I actually have just made myself a, an issue in GitHub to say that for a very highly used configuration file, we need to track um, the version changes so that we have a linting tool that can tell you for your configuration file, particularly when you go and upgrade, it'll tell you, you know, have you got leftover old con config options that are no longer relevant? And I'm planning on putting some restructured um, text tags in there for each config option to say what version it was introduced in. And that'll then inform the linting tool to, uh, to say, you know, show me the difference, what, what config options came and went and, you know, essentially a diff file in the documentation to say here are the changes between versions because particularly our documentation for that file is generated from the source. So we can insert that comment, those, that, that information into the source and then pull it out. Um, so yeah, there are, there are tools around. Cool. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Yay. <laughs> How do you prevent documentation rot? How do I, sorry? Prevent documentation rot. Documentation rot. What? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the reviews are the best way to go. Uh, you know, it is something that I'm struggling with because I'm not a Cyrus expert. You know, I use email, um, but I don't, you know, the internals of Cyrus is, is deep and, and nitty and the man sitting right in front of you is actually my, my local expert and he spends a lot of time answering my questions. So in terms of me identifying when things get old, it's, it's hard. Um, I do monitor all the commits and the change logs and I do monitor the issues that come through. That is manageable in a project the size of Cyrus where we've got sort of four or five core active developers and a number of sort of uh, periodic bug fixes but on something much larger, that would be impossible for one part-time person to do it all. Um, hopefully, through instituting this kind of thing, though, if you, can, if you can get your developers to start thinking about if they make a change, they also need to update the relevant documentation. It's the only way it's going to work because you can't, one documentation person can't do it all and the only people who know what has changed are the developers changing it. Yes. Yeah, that could work. <laughs> so I actually have a question, if you don't mind. Hit me up. Um, I absolutely agree that paid writers are a fantastic way to go. Um, it, it really does improve the documentation no end, simply because you have someone who's dedicated to doing the job. And I'm very lucky currently to be paid to work upstream. Um, but not all companies, or, or uh, say companies, because they're probably mm. where the money's going to be coming from uh, a lot of the time, not all companies necessarily place the same value on their writing contributions as they do on their, docu uh, on their coding contributions, and I've certainly been in that situation as well. Do you have any advice for how to go about uh, encouraging a company uh, to donate a bit of its time upstream the documentation? This is, this is a hard ask, and we were actually discussing it internally in the team last night about this because um, even within corporate culture, documentation is not often recognised as being as valuable as, as code. Um, people often don't even have a, a paid documenter within a, within a software product team. So convincing them to pony up dollars to do it for 
for someone else, you know, essentially giving IP away is, is downright impossible. So you need to, you know, if you're going to go and try and convince someone to invest money in this, you're going to go for some, a company of a size that, that hopefully already recognises the value of this sort of thing. Um, you are going to have better luck with a, with a company that is heavily invested into, you know, open source, um, obviously, and, and I think if you can uh, approach through networks like we're building today, if you can approach people who work within the kind of companies that you're thinking of targeting and say, hi, doc person working in this other company, you know, what would be the best way to go about approaching whoever it might be to say, you know, you, you build on this open source thing, it's good. Um, I do have um, a resource that's, that my talk's up on GitHub. Uh, I do have a resource in there for people looking to volunteer for documentation projects. And uh, I know in the Write the Docs channel they've been talking about, oh, well, you know, nobody's going to go and write documentation for free for exposure, you know, for people looking to break into the tech writing arena. There aren't very many people who, who go into tech writing as an initial career. Um, most of us often come from another background and then segue into it. So, and, and there is no sort of formal qualifications out there. So how do you go about sort of declaring at some point, right, I know enough to be a technical writer. So there is often this discussion, go and volunteer on an open source project. And there are places that you can go that, that people put up, hi, I'm looking for specific help on a specific project to do this specific thing. If you're a first timer or you're experienced and you just want to get involved, come and help out. That's all well and good, but I think people are really only going to get excited about documenting a project if they're already heavily using it. So if you're just looking, I want to get paid to work on open source software, um, that project will do, I'll go and find a company that will pay me to work on that thing, that's not going to be successful. You need to be active in the community already and then hopefully you already know which companies are using it, which companies are maybe submitting pull requests. Um, and then you're going to have better luck getting it in into them to sort of say, look, you seem to be raising a lot of issues in this area. Come along, employ me, and then I can be your advocate. And so, you know, leverage the knowledge. Cool. Thank you. Um, any last questions? Or do we sadly have to draw the docs down under to a close? <laughs> I think we do. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you again one last time. And, and a very big thank you to all of our speakers today. Really appreciate you coming. And it was an excellent, um, excellent day, actually. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. And hopefully, we'll maybe be able to make this into a yearly thing. So um, enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you very much for coming.